Welcome to our series of Healthcare Scene interviews where we sit down with top leaders in healthcare IT. I'm John Lin, the founder of healthcarescene.com, a network of leading healthcare IT resources, and we just announced the newly launched Health IT Expo. Go check it out at expo.health, where we're putting on a, a new Health IT conference focused on the practical things, a place where Health IT professionals from hospitals can be vulnerable, can share their challenges, and find solutions. So check that out at expo.health. Expo.health. And thanks. Uh, and we're excited to have a special guest today for a topic that you know really is trending around the nation, the opioid crisis. So we're excited to have our special guest today, uh, Paul Urig. He's Chief Administrative Legal and Privacy Officer for SureScripts. Welcome, Paul. Thanks, John. Happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Great. So, you know, before we talk about the opioid crisis, tell us just a little bit about yourself and about SureScripts. Sure. So as I said, I'm the, the Chief Legal Administrative and Privacy Officer. So I was a um, in private practice. And in 2001, some clients decided they wanted to create SureScripts. So my first involvement with SureScripts really starts from the very beginning. Then I joined as an employee in 2006, and I've had a number of roles over the years. Right now, I'm, I'm focused on you know, legal issues, policy, regulatory, privacy, security, and compliance. Um, so, you know, SureScripts was created by the owners. So it's the National Association of Chain Drug Stores, National Community Pharmacists Association, and the three big PBMs at the time to digitize the prescribing process, right? They really wanted to eliminate paper from the process to make it more efficient, to increase patient care to reduce costs and for security. And so we're really all about interoperability, right? Connecting providers, pharmacies, and payers. And hopefully everybody um, watching has experienced sort of the workflow that we facilitated here, right? When you, just to spend a moment on it, when you go, if you have an appointment with your physician tomorrow, and they're using one of the electronic health records, the EHRs that's connected to us and virtually all are connected to us. They'll send a message in the middle of the night, um, essentially saying you, you have an appointment and what we are able to do is return um, your formulary and eligibility information so that now the physician has some information that helps on payment decisions, your medication history um, so that now the, the, your, your provider has a better view of, of what's happening in your health. And then when you're there for the appointment, if a prescription's needed, right, it'll get sent electronically to the pharmacy of your choice. So that's what we're doing. We, um, we're connected, as I said, to almost all uh, EHRs that represent about 1.3 million prescribers to 98% of the pharmacies and to all of the big PBMs. And so we started with e-prescribing. We're beginning to extend into other services as well to go beyond e-prescribing. But that's that's the short history of SureScripts. Excellent. Well, you know, ever everyone knows SureScripts and e-prescribing go together, right? And I think it'll be interesting. Maybe we'll have you back for a future discussion about where else SureScripts is going. But today, let's talk about e-prescribing because I think it's an important element of the opioid discussion. So give people who you know maybe are doing it or maybe meaningful use push them to it because I know that pushed a lot of e-prescribing was the meaningful use requirements. But give us a kind of a history of the evolution of e-prescribing you know, regular drugs, but also the controlled substances where, as well. And where are we at today with e-prescribing? Sure. So the evolution from the creation, right? At the beginning, we were focused really about adoption, right? So from 2001, when we created the technology, it was deploying that technology uh, and, and getting physicians and pharmacists and PBMs to adopt it, right? That first time use. So very focused in, in, in those years on that. Then in 2009, and it was really um, you know, legislation that helped drive utilization, right? So we had good adoption. So then we focused in 2009 on utilization. People have the tool, now let's start using the tool, right? And so that time period of 2009 to say 2012, really was utilization and, and utilization really doubled during that period of time. And I think meaningful use uh, and a lot of the other 
policies helped drive e-prescribing as well as obviously, you know, the benefit. You know, one thing I, I, sh I should say, because it applies to both e non-controlled substances and controlled substances, is when we started, it was illegal in over 50 states to send a prescription electronically, right? So we had to work with state, uh, state boards of pharmacies, state legislatures to get it to be legal in throughout the United States. So that's something we spent a lot of time on. And, and then we also, to talk about controlled substances for a moment, um, even though it was legal to send a prescription electronically in all 50 states and the District of Columbia, the DEA, the Drug Enforcement uh, Administration, they, they prohibited e-prescribing of controlled substance. So we had to work with them for a number of years, I mean, you know, close to 10 years, quite frankly, working with them. And it was in 2010 that they actually made it legal if the EHRs and pharmacies meet certain requirements to prescribe electronically. So um, you know, we, we've been on this journey for, for quite a while now. So starting in 2013, then we're focused very much on quality. So when you talk about where are we, and as I said, Massive adoption, utilization by providers and pharmacies and PBMs, about 75% of all prescriptions are sent electronically. Uh, so that's, that, that's good progress. If you look at it from non-controls, it's about 90% of non-controlled uh, prescriptions are sent electronically. Where we still have a pretty big gap is for controlled substances. So if you look at controlled substances, only 14% of control uh, substances that are prescribed are sent electronically. So even seven years after the DEA adopted its rule, we got a pretty big gap there. Yeah, well, and I think that's going to serve as the basis for some of this discussion, right, is the, the lack of e-prescribing of controlled substances. But before we get there, you know, let's let's talk about the the opioid crisis in America. What is the core of the problem? I mean, and I, I think that's a complex question that probably deserves about you know six days, <laughs> a month to figure out. But you know, to you looking at it, and you, maybe we'll look at it from a technology standpoint. What's the core of the problem with the opioid crisis? Well, as you say, I, I think it's incredibly multi-dimensional. So you're right; it would take us a, a long time to, to get at it. We know the statistics, right? You know, 78 people every day die, 55 billion in costs to the system. Um, so through our lens, uh, it's, it's two things. It is one, knowledge and trust. And in a paper-based world, we'll say sort of a lack of it, right? So the lens we apply here is, is that providers often don't have all the necessary information to understand the health of their patients and you know where they may be getting services and in this discussion in particular other medications right so e-prescribing you know, helps by bringing that actionable intelligence right to the point of care so you know, so they'll know what medication is the patients are taking. Are they adhering to their medications? Um, what will be the cost of the medication? So that type of information. So I think a lack of information at the moment is a is a contributor to this. And then I think there is a trust question um, around. Uh, you know, there's a lot of forgery, et cetera. So how do we increase trust in the system? Uh, to help prevent uh, some of what's going on. Interesting. So, I mean, it, it's so interesting because I actually ran a pharmacy, uh, or not ran, but uh, did the technology for a pharmacy. And we always had to do our, uh, I think it was monthly reports to the DEA about what, you know, controlled substances were done. So it seems like from a macro level, they have a lot of the information of who pres who's prescribing what and to whom, uh, you know, what, but, you know, obviously it was delayed. It was only monthly, uh, you know, but, you know, you're talking almost, you're saying more, well, it's not so much the macro problem as it is getting it to the point of care to the prescriber so they know if someone's abusing the system or not, uh, which I think, you know, there's, there's, there's two sides of it. Uh, but it, to me, it seems like e-prescribing assists with both of those, no? 
No, you're right. I, I think it's very much, you know, as we put it, getting the right information to the right place at the right time, right? So that's that micro, to use your analogy, right? So, you know, you're right. Through e-prescribing, through the systems that are available, through reports that pharmacies have to provide and, and, and providers need to provide, there's probably a lot of information out there, right? But what's critical is in that moment, I think, when the patient's getting care, Right, from that provider, you know, that's when that decision's made, that's when that prescription's written. So to be able to provide this information, you know, in that context, uh, I, I think is really important. Interesting. And so, you know, what, what are the uh, technology solutions and, you know, how does e-prescribing help solve this problem? Uh, you know, because right now, we're, if, if we're at 14% adoption of controlled substance, it's probably not helping too much. But, you know, if, if it was 100%, what would that mean? Yeah, so I think some of the solutions um, that are available so is one, again, the availability of that medication history, right? And so now a provider has a better picture. And it's not just the meds that provider is prescribing. It's the medications that that patient is getting from other providers as well, right? And so you have a better picture of, of what the patient is, um, is taking. There's also a service, just to move off of the prescribing for a second, called National Record Locator Service that allows the provider to see what other providers a patient is seeing. So again, give some information about what's happening with that patient's care. So, you know, you have the medication history, that's getting the right information to the right person at the right time. Uh, the e-prescribing itself, that routing piece of it. Uh, is important because it's very secure, right? We see statistics that say up to 13, 14% of diversion occurs just because someone stole the paper pad off of the desk, right? And so we're eliminating that paper, right? And under the DEA rule, there are heightened security provisions, steps that a provider has to take and that a pharmacy has to take. So you have ID, identification proving, two-factor authentication before the, before the doctor can send it. Um, it has to be encrypted, the entire chain. No one can change that prescription, and there's extra protocols in place to ensure that. So because you have that greater security and that greater trust, um, um, you, know, you have less diversion, quite frankly. So... So, you know, those are the tools. I think also in terms of adherence is very important, right? E-prescribing and the data that flows gives providers a view of, of a patient's adherence to their drugs, right? Is my patient still on the drug? Have they fallen off so that they can intervene the right way? So all of these you know, are tools that can certainly help uh, providers uh, giving care to their patients. Yeah, I mean, it brings up some interesting points. Uh, the, the first one is the identity, right? And, you know, I think you're right that they've put, a, you know, you and many others have put a lot of thought into making sure that e-prescribing of controlled substances solves that identity issue. But I think that's, you know, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems like that's a major reason why many of them aren't adopting it, is it's almost an onerous process or at least a challenging process. You know, is that true from your experience or, or why else do you see I'm not doing the controlled substances? No, I think that is that is a piece of the puzzle, right? I think, um, you know, first off, there's always been sort of almost a lack of information that in fact e-prescribing is legal, right? Okay. And <laughs> I'd like to think after seven years, we've, we've come far. Programs like this certainly help the cause, right? So first is just you can in fact do this legally if you have systems that comply with the law. Um, we've often heard uh, exactly what you're talking about, right? That because of these extra steps that a physician or a provider or a prescriber needs to take to become ID proofed, right? That takes time, right? Two-factor authentication, you're changing workflows, right? And any of us who've been involved in technology, you start changing the workflows, right? You, you, you create issues, excuse me, you create barriers, right? And so uh, there's been a lot of discussion about what can be done about that. I don't think the law is going to change. 
I don't think the DA is going to step back from any of this. I mean, it's sort of interesting that seven years later, we're still dealing with an interim final rule. Um, and maybe this is an issue only a lawyer could love, but still that's an interim seven years later. Um, but I don't see the DEA stepping back from, from those. So, you know, I think the challenge is to get uh, processes in place and technologies in place that help overcome that barrier. From time to time, we've heard about cost issues, you know, um, don't know, uh, you know, whether those are, um, you know, what's happening out there in the market in terms of the cost of these systems. You know, what we do know is most of the systems are compliant now. Uh, and should be available to their prescribers. But yeah, I, I think dealing with some of those workflow issues will help. Well, and I think part of the challenge is it's a perception thing as much as anything. Like, oh, I got to do all this extra work. And then they, when they do it, they're like, hey, that wasn't too bad, right? <laughs> right. right, exactly, exactly. And from a regulation standpoint, you know, we're actually seeing the opposite, right? I mean, you, you said they're, they're not going to back off, and I agree. But we're actually seeing, you know, for example, in New York and Vermont, they've mandated uh, e-prescribing of controlled substances. Uh, uh, so, you know, I mean, I think we're seeing the opposite happen. I think it will eventually happen across the nation where you have to do it electronically because they need the data in order to combat things like the opioid crisis. So you know, let's, let's talk about that. I mean, it's been mandated in New York and Vermont. So are we seeing good results from those mandates? And, and, and uh, you know, I want to be clear, you know, I, I, you know, results, one result is adoption. Right, which is what meaningful use did. Meaningful use encouraged adoption of EHR, and if that's your your measurement, then meaningful use was successful, right? But right. if your your measurement is okay, it was adopted, and now we're seeing great results because we can control the opioid crisis more effectively. Or you know, are we seeing good results that way as well? You know, and also, what is the adoption in New York and Vermont? Because I've heard some people are still behind even there, but love to hear your thoughts. Right. So, you know, maybe let's take a moment on the regulatory perspective. So you're right. I've been talking about the DEA rule, right, which allowed e-prescribing of controlled substances. Uh, what the states have begun to do is actually mandate the use of e-prescribing, especially for controlled substances, spurred by the opioid crisis, right? You know, as we've talked about, devastating crisis, and some states uh, have acknowledged that e-prescribing can help. And so they've begun this journey to actually mandate it. Now, you know, mandates are always tricky things, right? You know, most people don't like to be told what to do, but it's, you know, it's a factor that, that the states are beginning uh, to do this. So New York was first, right? They adopted what's called the I-STOP law back in, um, uh, I, just, I just lost my way, back in 2016. Well, no, no, it went before then. So, you know, a few years ago, they adopted the I-STOP law, right? And it, they mandated e-prescribing, not only of controlled substances, but quite frankly, of all drugs. And there were some other components to it. So in New York, we have seen good progress. So enablement, so this is physician enablement, has uh, in 2016 increased by about 45%. So 72% of all docs in, in New York, at least now, are enabled to send a controlled substance. So that's a huge increase from where we were when the law was adopted. Pharmacy enablement has gone up 7%, but they were already way up there. So they're at 98% enablement, right? So pharmacy was sort of leading the charge. Uh, and then the percent of, of controlled substances prescribed increased by over 50%. So we're seeing good utilization in New York. So that tells you the numbers of uh, sort of what's being routed uh, and usage. Now what we're shifting to do is working with others in New York is, okay, this is terrific. Right? Is it now having an impact on the opioid crisis, right? What's the impact on healthcare? So we're partnering with some people up there to do some research. So it's not just about utilization, but the actual impact. So the experience in New York has been good. And what I think a lot of states did uh, when they saw what New York was doing is they took a step back and said, let's see what the experience is like, and then maybe we'll replicate it. And we are seeing that. So you mentioned Vermont, right? So Vermont certainly has a, 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 a law that requires e-prescribing of controlled substances. There's four other states that have adopted 
right, laws. So um, uh, Connecticut, Rhode Island, North Carolina, and Virginia have all uh, adopted laws. Those will go into effect in the future. And then we got four other states, Illinois, Massachusetts, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania, that are at the moment are considering laws. But we're definitely seeing this movement. You know, part of, of any of these rules is, right, what's the enforcement? Does it have teeth, right? So for instance, Minnesota was actually one of the first states to adopt a law mandating e prescribing, but it has no teeth. Right. And so it hasn't had the impact. So the experience in New York has been good. Other states are starting to follow their lead and we expect to see some results. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, it, yeah, obviously some of the impact is pushing the information down to the provider level, which makes it hard to measure what's the value of that. But one, one of the goals, I think, uh, one, uh, maybe I guess one, one of the goals I have for this type of thing, because I've seen the problem of uh, chronic patients who actually need the opioid drugs in many ways getting discriminated against uh, because other people are abusing it and some people really need it. And so they get discriminated against. Uh, some of it's just stigma and perception, but mm -hmm. I think some of it is when they go to their doctor and the doctor thinks they're a drug seeker when in fact they really need it. So, you know, will the technology and e-prescribing help to solve that problem, at least help assist with that problem as well? You know, I, I believe so. And it gets back to that knowledge and trust issue, right? So, um, and I believe a lot, of, you know, a good portion of the discrimination is because of a lack of knowledge and a lack of trust. So again, if you look at these tools, right, now a provider can get uh, with that better view of what's really happening with the patient, better knowledge, better actionable intelligence, you know, can say, okay, you really do need this prescription, right? You need this drug. You're not on five other drugs that do a similar thing or may have uh, contraindicated effects, et cetera, right? So uh, the fact that these tools bring knowledge, I think helps in that discrimination issue. And it's the trust issue, right? And so this falls a little bit on the pharmacy side, right? That there is such trust now that when I've gotten this prescription as a pharmacist to dispense it, I have a higher level of confidence that it's real, right? That it's accurate, valid, and real, right? And don't have the uncertainty if they see the piece of paper, well, is this fraud, you know, et cetera. And so I, I believe this higher level of trust is also going to help in this, uh, you know, what is a real life situation that some people aren't getting the meds that they actually need. That's interesting. Uh, <laughs> in the kind of a mundane example, my wife signed my son's uh, folder for his school or some, some permission slip. And my son took it and turned it in and the teacher said, that's not your mom's signature, but it was. Right, right, exactly. <laughs> so you can imagine, you know, some of the opioid, uh, the, the patients who need those opioid drugs to take it in and the pharmacist says, is that their signature? <laughs> right. Yeah, you don't right. have that problem with the prescribing, right? Exactly. exactly. Yep. Well, I think that's interesting. You know, I, and I love that you push it down to them. Uh, you know, the question though I, of trust, I think also comes from the pr provider perspective. Do they trust that that's everything? You know, how, how far along are we on on really having all of the drugs available to them through a service like SureScripts, where they can download it and know the latest, or you know, or, you know, or even from the provider locator service that you talked about, right? And knowing all the providers they're going to, are, are we there yet? I mean, it seems like we're farther along with drugs than we are any other health information. But where are we at as far as having a comprehensive drug database that doctors can trust, or then not fear that there's something missing? Right. No, you know, there are gaps. So I, I think if you look in any region, uh, we have about 80% coverage, right? So um, there is a gap still. Uh, that gap uh, tends to be... Um, so what's important to know is is the, the, the people providing the data are, are pharmacies out of their dispense records, right? Mm -hmm. And PBMs out of the claims records. Those are our data sources. And so um, that gives a pretty full history. Where there may be a gap is if there's an independent pharmacist, for instance, that's not providing data and you have a cash pay patient, right? So 
You know, we're not going to get it from pharmacy. You're not going to get it from the payer. So that's one example of a gap. Um, you know, uh, uh, DOD systems. You know, uh, there are locations where drugs are dispensed that um, th that don't come through our service, right? And so there will be some gaps there that we certainly would like to close. So um, we think it's really good, but you're right, it's not 100%, uh, but we're working to get there. In terms of you know a record locator service, I think we're still in the big end by we, I'm talking industry, um, we're still in the early stages of that, but we're seeing some good progress, some good initial experiences. And what we're finding is, is providers are are learning a lot, right? You know, we, we were working with one health system in the middle of the country and they were quite surprised at, you know, everybody says healthcare is local. Well, this service suggests maybe it's not quite as local as everybody thinks, right? You got people going to maybe where their parents live getting care, for example, the snowbird scenario, a whole factor of scenarios that indicates uh, people are getting care in a lot of different places all around the country. So um, we got work to do, but I think we're we're off to a good start. That's great. Well, in in Vegas, we say the best healthcare you get is McCarran Airport, but <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah, because we want to fly somewhere else. But uh, right. well, yeah, we only have about two minutes left. But I just wanted to hear. You know, we talked about the opioid crisis, but it seems like a lot of this is helpful for the natural disaster as well. Maybe we have to have you back uh, talk natural disasters and drug prescribing. Can you talk about some of the work you did there? Just, you know, a quick uh, synopsis. I think that's an important part of this as well, that, you know, this can solve a lot of problems, not just the opioid. Right, right. So, yeah, real briefly, what we have found is when we have a natural disaster or, heaven forbid, a man-made disaster, but like a hurricane, and you have um, pharmacies that are closed down, providers that can't get access to records, but importantly, patients that are being displaced, either going to shelters or maybe going to a different city and they're on chronic meds, most patients don't remember what medications they're on, don't remember what the dosage is, right? And they'll show up, for instance, at a pharmacy and said, here's my bag of drugs. I don't know what it is. I've run out. The bottle was underwater. You know, you can't see it. So you have people out there needing their drugs but can't remember what they're on. So by using a medication history service like ours, by us making it accessible to people who, you know, first responders who don't normally have access to that, it's really helpful for them to be able to say, okay, I see you're on Y drug, okay, we're gonna get it to you so that these patients who are on these chronic drugs can stay on them during this very difficult time in their lives. So I just gave you a 60 seconds on a, on a, on a big, big project that we did and that we're working on, but that at a high level, that's, that's, it's getting that information again to the right person at the right time for the right care. Yep. No, I think, I think it's beautiful. And, and it's nice that they suspended HIPAA during the crisis. So you were allowed to do certain things like that. Uh, yeah, but there's a lot of facets, like you said. <laughs> right. Exactly. Yep. Great. Well, uh, thanks so much for the insight. You know, I, I think it's interesting to see the evolution and we need to push forward the prescribing of controlled substance to really assist in the opioid crisis because that information is power when combating it. So thanks so much for uh, joining me. Uh, and uh, thanks for everyone that watched live or the recorded. Uh, if you want to watch more great content like this, you can check it out at healthcarescene.com or search for the Healthcare Scene YouTube channel uh, on YouTube. It's easy to find. Just search Healthcare Scene. Thanks we went to my special guest, Paul Urig, Chief Administrative Legal and Privacy Officer for Surscripts. Thanks, Paul. Thank you for having me. Have a good day.